Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sixth Angular Belgrade Meetup. For today, we have two talks by our guests, Emma and Muhammad. Unfortunately, Michel won't be able to join us today, but we will hear his talk at the one of the following meetups. So the first speaker for today is Emma Twersky, a developer relations engineer in Angular team at Google. Welcome, Emma, and thank you very much for accepting my invitation to join us today. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Let me give you access to my screen. Oh, oh no. To fix it. Ooh. I might need to exit and rejoin to be able to share. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sometimes when you update Chrome, you run into this. I don't know if you have. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to talk about version 14 once I can update or can share my screen. Okay, let's see. No worries. Um, yeah, if you update Chrome, I'm always on the Canary build, and it uh, does not like screen sharing at all. This says that it can. Yeah, might uh, some kind of things may happen, so don't worry about it. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ima will be going to talk on a state of Angular, Marco. Yes, she she will give a talk on Angular fourteen. Okay, perfect. So, uh, we we had released. Okay, Ima is here. Oh yeah, I'm back. Um, I should be able to share. Let's see. Yay! Okay, we're back. <laughs> yeah, Great. I don't know if any. Yeah, if you've ever seen, oops, if you've ever seen that error, um, yeah, there's like a Chrome bug with screen sharing, um, and corporate computers because <laughs> uh, my name is Emma Twersky and I work on the Angular team at Google. Um, and my corporate computer was very close to not wanting me to share all the juicy details of version 14 just now. So uh, we are going to be talking about Angular version 14, which is coming in just about, uh, I should have a countdown on my uh, clock, but it is coming in like two or three weeks. So we're very excited to share everything that will be included in this release. Um, and this is maybe a little early juicy sneak peek at everything. Um, version 14 is massive. There are a ton of really cool things. Um, we have two major RFCs included, including closing our top GitHub issue um, and actually our second top GitHub issue. So there's a lot there. Uh, and I want to talk about everything that's included. So um, we are, as I said, just about two weeks out. Uh, we are about 99% of the way there, there is actually a release candidate out on uh, NPM's registry. So if you ng updated dash dash next, you would get to see a lot of what I'm about to talk about. Um, so if you're interested in anything and you just can't wait, uh, then feel free to update to the RC and test this out. Again, that's a release candidate, not a stable build, but uh, if you just can't wait, um, this is actually totally available right now. So uh, a lot of hype. What What's new? So five things I'm really excited to highlight are uh, standalone components, typed forms, uh, page title accessibility, um, authoring better reusable components, which is my way of clumping together a bunch of really cool little featurettes into 
a bigger thing. And then CLI auto completion, which I think is actually my favorite thing. Um, this was sort of a dark horse. This snuck in as like my favorite thing. Um, although clearly standalone components and type forms are getting a lot more uh, community hype. So these are the five I'm going to talk about plus a little bit more. Um, and there's so much more beyond this of what is in the release. So standalone components are a way to streamline the authoring of Angular applications by reducing the need or eliminating ng modules. Uh, in version 14, we will be releasing standalone components under developer preview, which means they're totally ready to be used. Um, you can explore, you can develop with them but they aren't yet a stable API. So that means that there will potentially be changes outside of our typical model, where normally when we release something, we guarantee backwards compatibility. We also guarantee stability and that we won't deprecate something um, for two releases. Uh, we also guarantee that uh, if we do introduce breaking changes, they would only be in a major version. Um, standalone components won't quite have that same level of promise just yet. And that's really just because we're excited to release them. We want early feedback, but we don't know what we don't know. They're like a pretty major change to the fundamental idea of what Angular apps look like. And so we're really excited to see how people use them. But in case something comes up where we want to make a change to them, we want to reserve the right to do that. Um, so maybe not time for prod. Um, so with standalone components, directives, and pipes, all you're going to do is add the standalone true flag to your import field um, directly in the component decorator tagged component. Um, and there's no module. So like no module file. You're not importing and exporting components, directives, or pipes out of a module. It stands on its own, which is where it gets the same standalone. Um, there's a Stacklets demo if you go to my Twitter that shows what this is. But here, I just want to dig into what that looks like. So um, here we have a demo standalone component. This is like a single component app. So I'm like bootstrapping the component here. But here I have an example standalone component. And I import bootstrapping. I in, uh, import the core component decorator. That's like all normal. And then the new thing is that I'm going to, in my decorator, um, introduce the standalone true flag. And this means that this component doesn't need to be attached to a module to be able to be bootstrapped and shown to the application. And so my app, if I compiled this, would just be a hello uh, h1 tag. But this would totally compile. It would totally work. Um, and that's really cool. So if we want to make this a little bit more complicated, um, because maybe our apps look a little more complicated than a hello tag, uh, let's say I have another component. Um, so let's say that inside of my component, I have an image component uh, that is also a standalone app or a standalone component. I can import my standalone component directly to the import field of my new standalone component. Um, and then I can use that image components uh, selector directly within my template. So I have access just by importing it in the import field of my component. I have access to that standalone component. I can render it. Here I would get my little image component. Um, I could pass in, uh, let's say, like a class variable um, of the URL of the image I want to render. Um, and this would, again, like totally render, totally works. Uh, you can also use components that are not part of, um, but not standalone. Um, and so that means that that other component is part of a module. So let's say I wanted to use a component that's part of a module, uh, specifically, let's say a material card. So here I would import the module that that component is a part of. Here I'm importing my Mac card module from Angular Material. Uh, I'm adding it to my import field. So you see I added the Mac card module to my import. And then in my template, again, like same thing, I'm using the Mac card selector. I have access to it because I imported the module to this component. And I still have a fully standalone component that doesn't have its own module. I'm accessing components 
from other modules. I'm accessing other standalone components. I'm importing them all. Uh, and this would render a material card that has an image in it. And even more so, um, I also am importing common module. So uh, let's say I want to use like an ng if um, or other sort of like Angular common um, selectors, decorators, things like that. I can import common module directly to my imports as well um, and access things like ng if, uh, anything like that. And then finally, let's say I have a standalone directive. So somewhere I have a directive that adds like a highlighter um, or something like that, like changes the styling uh, of a uh, text HTML field. Um, I can also import a standalone directive again directly. So I'm importing highlight directive uh, that like highlights the app. Uh, I'm adding it to my import field and I'm adding it to my template. And again, all of this is standalone um, and has really nice compatibility. Uh, I wanna highlight that like you can write standalone components, you can write standalone directives and you can write standalone pipes. And you can also um, import pipes that are uh, and components and directives that are part of other modules. And if I was in a component that was part of a module, you can also import standalone components there. So they have full compatibility back and forth between both the standalone world and the not standalone world. Um, so there's a ton of really cool stuff to explore here. Uh, if you're interested, this is all in the RC and also for all of version 14, we will be testing this. We're like super excited to hear your feedback. Um, because at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do and the reason you should care and be excited is we're streamlining authoring, right? Like it's a now a single file. Um, even if you're styling here and your template is another file, uh, we're getting rid of this like mental model of having to group things together in modules. Um, and we're hopefully creating a better developer experience, especially focused on new developers. Um, at the end of the day, this is in developer preview. So we're not entirely sure what that means. Uh, remember, we're not like completely promising backwards compatibility, but we're really confident we've tested this a ton and we're really excited about the future of this. Um, so definitely go give it a try if you're excited about it as well. Um, again, if you want like a demo um, or a stack blitz to start from, there's one on my Twitter. Um, my handle is Twersky. Uh, it's in the bottom of all of the slides except this one. Um, cool. So that's standalone. Let's talk about typed forms. So Angular v14 closes the top GitHub issue, which was implementing strict typing into the Angular reactive form package. And what this means is typed forms ensure that the values inside of your form controls, your form groups, your form arrays are all type safe across the entire API surface. And the reason this matters is obviously we write TypeScript. We love TypeScript. And the reason we love TypeScript is because typing enables safer forms. Um, especially for deeply nested complex cases. Uh, and it's also uh, a result of a public request for comment if you're interested in more of the design and um, like design rationale of what it actually looks like under the hood. Uh, you can go to our GitHub discussions to see what this looks like. So let's take a look at what uh, Typeform looks like. So in Angular version 14, um, form group and form control are all typed. So here, let's say I create a cat. My cat's name is Barb Smith. Um, my real cat's name is Rhubarb. Uh, and she has nine lives. Um, now, if I go and say, how many lives left does Barb have? Uh, I would know that if I tried to access the value of lives, there's no substring on it, right? So this would throw an error. Uh, as I was typing this in my code editor, it would actually catch this error uh, because it knows that substring doesn't exist on number and it knows that lives is of type number, um, which is so cool because previously that wasn't the case. Uh, and you can imagine how in complex cases like this does weird things where you expect something to be a number, it's a string, you expect something to be a string, you can do like weird number operations on it um, and typing is really great. Similarly, uh, we know that lives is not optional. Uh, we know that we haven't made this nullable and therefore you cannot remove controls that are uh, enforced or required. 
And finally, uh, we know that if form groups don't have controls that we're trying to access, they will also throw errors. So let's say you're trying to get a, a form control on a form group that doesn't exist. We can now throw an error because we know what the form group should look like. We have the typing on it um, and we know that that's not possible. So when you update, if you have a form, what you'll see is that the update schematic actually migrates all of your forms over to a new class um, called untyped form group, untyped form control, and untyped form array. So you'll see a ton of instances of the word untyped introduced into your forms. The reason for this is that we've found that migrating incrementally is the best way to make use of the typing. Um, and if we just suddenly throw types on your forms, you can run into a bunch of errors. So what we've done is when you update with ng update, uh, you'll see a bunch of instances of untyped. Uh, we've moved everything over, so there's no breaking there. Uh, it should compile and it should work as expected um, or as it did prior to updating. And then what we recommend doing is literally just like command shift F search for the word untyped and slowly migrate your form groups, your form controls, everything over to the typed version by removing just that untyped word. Um, and as you move over to the new version of form group, form control, form array, which are typed, you can start to debug and make sure that those typings actually do work in your application with your code. Um, so this is like super backwards compatible and it enables you to slowly introduce typing at your own pace um, incrementally by again, migrating from the untyped version to the typed version. I'll also say like, there are reasons that maybe the untyped version works for you. We're not deprecating untyped forms because we know that like, maybe there's cases where lives could be a number, uh, but it also could be a string. Let's say like, there's such thing as like fruit lives or I don't know, something like that. Um, in that case, if you expect that a form control could be of multiple types, strong typing doesn't help your form. Um, and so we want to make sure you have the option of having an untyped form control on your form if you expect that behavior. So in that case, you would use untyped. It would be explicit. Um, it is super readable code because you're explicitly saying this is untyped and you don't want typing there. Um, but for the most part, typed forms are fantastic. Um, the other really cool thing is that uh, the code editor itself can now provide typing support because we are telling it what typing uh, things should be. So here, again, I have this form group. And as I try and access values, um, you can see live that like in this GIF, as you're accessing values on your form, it like knows the typing so it can throw the errors. It can give you recommendations for uh, what you can do based on the type of let's say like address, it can say that like street name has a string, like it knows that's a string um, and it can do stuff with that, right? So very cool. Um, yeah, so that's type forms. Uh, the reason this is important is A, like you can fix your forms, right? Strong typing is way more type safe. It's way safer. It's so much better of a developer experience, especially if you're running into things where like, again, you were getting unexpected things on your forms. Number three, page title accessibility. So it is a best practice in single page apps that the page title uniquely communicates what's on your page. So I'm sure you have more than this tab open on your browser right now. If you look at the top, you can see you have a ton of uh, page titles. So whatever is at the top in your like little tab is what the page title of that app is. And you can see that like, let's say I have four different code pens open and each of my code pens says what is on that code pen. So it's not just saying like code pen, code pen, code pen, where I need to click into that tab to see what that code pen is of. From just the page title, I can see that I have like typed forms code pen. I have a uh, standalone component code pen. And so I don't even need to go into that page to know what is there. Um, and that's like a best practice for accessibility to know what's on the page without having to navigate into it. But it's also just a UX thing, right? Like it would be really frustrating if with my like 20 tabs open right now, it said the same thing, just like a website on each one. Cause then like, <laughs> that's super frustrating to have to go into each tab to know what is there. 
So version 13.2 introduced a streamlined way to do this with the title dot or route dot title property, where now you can add a title uh, to your route and it's strongly typed due to uh, actually a community contribution by Marco himself. So I want to make sure to give a shout out in this meetup, um, but we're super excited about that. So what that looks like is here I have a definition of my routes. Um, I make sure to give a title and now I can just say in addition to the path and the component rendered, I can also say wh what I want that title to be. So for instance, instance the home page, I want to make sure it says home. Uh, the about page I say about me. You can also do more complex things uh, by providing a custom title strategy. So here um, I'm doing the same thing, but instead of having to repeat the stuff that says like my app dash, uh, I uh, am using a title strategy to be a little bit more uh, intelligent about that, which means that let's say like this scales to 70 routes. Um, I know that I am providing uh, some logic of what I want my titles to look like with a title strategy. And again, um, this is really great, especially you used to have to import title strategy or import uh, router services um, and title services to manage this manually, which is fine. Um, a lot of apps do this, but it means that a lot of developers were implementing the same code across every new app you create. Um, and it also means that we're making developers have to go do something that we know we can just do ourselves. Um, so this enables us to be more accessible. Uh, it's a better developer experience because it's like a single line, right? All you're doing is adding your title. You're not having to like go import the like service for your title and manage it and check that it's changed and wash all of that. Like it's just providing a title. Uh, it's a way better user experience for your end developer or end users. And it actually um, can create better page analytics data if you're using like Google Tag Manager page title. Uh, and unique page title is really important for um, analytics and stuff like that. Uh, number four is authoring better reusable components. Um, this is a bit of a speed run. There's a bunch of stuff here. Um, to start out, the component dev kit, um, which provides a whole suite of tools for building uh, really good Angular reusable components. Um, is promoting CDK menu and CDK dialogue to stable. Uh, so this means that you can use things like, um, I mean, all of these orange CDK directives for the menu um, to create menu items, uh, targets for your menu aim, menu bars, things like that. Um, so a ton of different primitives for dialogue and menu creation. Along with that, the component test harness, which is a flexible way to write better tests for your component, uh, now has new methods for harness loader that checks if a harness is present, as well as returning the instance of the harness. Um, this is like a super non-brittle way of testing components where you're actually testing the component itself, not like the CSS selector for checking if there's like an H1 with a certain ID. Because let's say like somebody else goes and changes that ID, then your tests break, right? Um, so that's pretty brittle. Uh, test harnesses are a great way to get around that and actually test the component itself, not the like implementation details of the CSS inside of it. Um, along with that, this one is like a really big sort of hidden one, but you can now use or access protected uh, component members directly in your templates. So here I have a protected message string um, that says hello world and my component template is able to actually access that message. Um, this is another community contribution from a, a different team at Google. But the idea here is it gives you access over what is public about the API surface of your reusable component. It allows you to say like, hey, in a menu bar, like I always want this to be menu, um, but you can still make that a reusable component. Um, so I highly recommend going through your classes as you update and thinking about if uh, class variables or component members should actually be protected. And if you want to make sure that those aren't being manipulated or changed, um, because you can now do that. And then finally, uh, V14 adds support for passing in an optional injector uh, when creating an embedded view through uh, view container ref, create, an embed create embedded view and template ref. Um, and the injector allows for dependency injection to be 
customized within the template, um, which again is a cleaner API for reusable surfaces um, or reusable components. So yeah. Uh, why is all of this great? Uh, in Angular, we love writing reusable components. We love writing testable reusable components. And we love when the code is better in your testable reusable components. Um, so I think like specifically the protected member um, access is like a really great addition for usable components, but all of these are great. Then finally, we have CLI auto completion, uh, where I type ng suburb, right? Like I have typos in my CLI commands constantly. Um, typing is just hard sometimes. I don't know if you feel that way. Uh, feel free to put your biggest typo in the chat of this meeting. But um, mine is N-G-S-E-V-R-E -E instead of serve, S-E-R-V-E. -E. And luckily, Angular v14 now has um, real-time type ahead auto completion. So when you update, we have a new command called ng-completion. Um, the CLI will prompt you to opt in to auto complete uh, on your first command execution in v14. So just updating your CLI to v14, you'll be able to add this to your CLI. Um, you can also run ng completion if you opt out and at some point then want to opt in. And what this does is here you can see that um, we provide auto complete. So let's say you like type ng and you're not sure what you want to do. Clicking tab, you'll see all the options. Um, let's say like you don't run a type out component. Um, we will auto complete that for you. Uh, it also has a uh, reference to your actual production environment. Um, so here you can see, oh, I'd have to wait for it to loop. But you can see if you type like ng build dash C and you're looking at what type of build you want to do, it has the knowledge from your Angular JSON and package shot JSON to know if you what the options are. Um, let's say you have like a dev environment and a production environment, it would know to be able to auto complete those things. Um, since it's smart about the Angular code that it's looking at. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is like a huge one. And essentially, like, why should you care? Because typos are terrible. Um, and we're solving those. So those are my five. But I want to, like, quickly talk about a few more. Um, extended diagnostics uh, are an extendable framework that gives you insight into your templates and how you can improve them. Um, they're a compile time warning with precise actionable steps in your templates to catch bugs before runtime. So the sooner you catch the bug, the better. Uh, it's best if you find them when you write the bug versus in your production build when like somebody is trying to use your app and runs into an error, clearly. Uh, we introduced two to start, which is banana in a box, which here, like we are smart enough in Angular to now say like, hey, technically you can put your brackets inside your parentheses for data binding. But we know that in Angular, you probably mean to put the banana, like the two parentheses inside the brackets. Um, so we can throw an error and we can give you guidance of exactly what to switch. We also have docs on this um, and we can warn you that that's probably not what you want. Um, similarly with catching nullish coalescing, so the two question marks, if we know that username is not nullable, there's no reason to write nullish coalescing on it because that'll never be caught. Uh, it's not a nullable value. Um, but the really cool thing about this is like those are the two errors we're starting with. Um, but this is an extensible, flexible framework. And we're really excited about what this introduces for new diagnostics in the future. So if you're thinking about contributing to Angular, this would be a great place to do that. Um, we have a ton of GitHub issues open for how we think we can extend extended diagnostics to be really beneficial um, because this is like a massive framework for saying like, hey, we can look at your Angular code and we can make it better and we can make sure you're not writing errors. And not only can we make sure you're not writing errors, but if you do write an error, we can give you really, really detailed feedback on how to fix that error, um, which is super cool. Let's see, uh, which is great because we want to tell you if your code is wrong, we want to catch your errors prior to runtime, we want to give you ways to solve those errors, and we also want to make an extendable framework that can be extended. Uh, similarly, uh, more tree-shakable errors 
Um, so in version 13, in version 12, uh, we introduced debugging guides with error numbers. Um, and so a community contribution by Ramesh actually adds error codes. Um, and by adding additional runtime error codes, we're making errors easy to reference. And we're also making it so that we can tree shake them out of your production bundle. Um, so here, um, you can see that uh, if you have an error uh, before version 13 or 14, we didn't have a number associated. Now we've added a number. And what that means is when it comes down to the production bundle, we tree shake the strings, which means we can make the strings longer because they're not going to make it to your production bundle. So we can give more detail in the error. And then when it comes down to the actual production bundle, we'll just give you the number so that you can reference and look up in our docs what that error was. But we don't need to give you the long string, which means we're tree shaking like a ton of really long strings out of your bundle, um, which is cool. Uh, that means we deploy prod builds without like long error messages, and we can make those error messages more verbose without worrying about uh, bundle size. And then finally, uh, experimental ESM builds. So uh, version 14 introduces experimental ES build based build system, uh, which compiles pure ESM output. Um, you can try this by updating the browser builder target in your Angular JSON from browser to browser ES build. Um, and if you do this, please give us feedback on if this impacts or improves your app's performance. Uh, we're still actively testing this and we're super excited about feedback here. Um, and those were my five cough, cough, eight um, stars of things to look forward to in version 14. So standalone components, typed forms. I'm really excited about page title accessibility and Marco's improvement to it with strong typing. All of the authoring of reusable component stuff, the protected member stuff, all that is really cool. CLI auto completion is my favorite, I think. Um, extended diagnostics are super cool. Tree shakeable error messages. Anytime the word tree shaking is involved, you know it's a good thing. Um, and ESM build. So in the chat, uh, let me know which number is your favorite or are you most excited to go try? Um, I'd be interested to see what the favorite is or maybe the favorite too, because I think standalone components is going to win, but that's like a little unfair. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Emma. You can reach me at the bottom here. My Twitter is Twersky, uh, my last name with my first initial. And I'm super excited to talk to y'all. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much, Emma, for the great presentation. And I'm very happy to see that many new features are coming in version 14. Um, I have one question for you. Uh, does Angular team plan to add standalone APIs for functionalities that are currently available only via ng modules i mean can we expect can we expect standalone apis for functionalities provided by router module or http client module for example yeah i think so we've talked about it um i think like a really good example would be like are we going to release a standalone version of all of angular material you know like Mm -hmm. uh, or are we going to like create a world where we offer a standalone version of every directive that we offer so you're not importing those modules? Um, I don't know if it's going to be universally like, yes, everything will have two, uh, or if we will make decisions about what moves over. Uh, that's still like an active discussion and probably will be an RFC um, of like what that world looks like. I think a lot of it has to do with when we see how people start to use standalone components, honestly. Because um, right now our recommendation is like, don't migrate your entire app to standalone. Maybe like introduce a few, um, like standalone apps, maybe not, but standalone components, yes. So in a world where we start to write fully standalone apps, I like think that will have to be something we do, but it's not like immediate. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And the next question is also related to uh, standalone components. So, can standalone components completely replace ng module, or are there use cases where ng modules is still the only option? Um. Sorry, I'm muting myself. Uh. Yeah. Great question. Um. 
With the developer preview release of standalone components, we aren't rewriting all of our docs just yet. Um, we want to figure out what the getting started journey looks like. Uh, we know, I mean, Angular at Google has mass adoption. There's like 35,000, 3,500, not thousand apps um, that are Angular uh, at Google. And that includes like cloud, like Google Cloud is Angular, um, which is massive. So at some point in code size, we recognize that like modules are really helpful for grouping together, like when there's hundreds of people working on an app, the mental model of like where the groupings exist within apps. And so we don't have a huge, we don't have a great answer for at what point and at what scale modules become necessary. I do think that like my speculation is that small apps standalone really is like, like going to be really great at that scale. And at some point you might want to start to introduce modules if your app becomes a certain size. We don't know what that size is yet, but in theory, there's nothing stopping standalone from becoming the future of Angular and replacing ng modules. Um, there aren't any use cases where it would break I think it just becomes sort of a decision of at what point the mental model becomes useful uh, of introducing that good. Yes. yes. I think um, I, I saw on Twitter uh, a new fix for inject function from Angular core package that can make us to, to write uh, some kind of hooks within uh, Angular components, yeah, which completely. is nice. It gives a lot of options to, to write the code in different way. Yeah, it's very much like a factory model of like almost reactive, like reactivity. It, yeah, it's, it's uh, exposing the dependency injection system of Angular in a new way. Let's see. Yeah, thank you. Number one is your favorite. Let's see. Is there a question here? No. Yep, completely. Uh, standalone components are totally for new developers um, or like small apps, right? Like if you're writing single component Angular modules to begin with, like you probably don't need that module. So this is the path towards not having modules if you don't need them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I'm really excited. Uh, I highly recommend if you want to go test any of this stuff, do ng update dash dash next to target the RC. Um, and again, like tweet me if you have any questions or if you run into a bug, open it on our GitHub um, and I will reply. But thank you. Super excited for version 14. Yeah, me too. Great. Thank you. Thanks again, Emma. Uh, for joining us today. I think that we really enjoyed and have a nice day. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, the next talk uh, for today uh, is by Mohamed. Mohamed will talk about auxiliary routes in Angular. Uh, Mohamed, you can share your screen if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, is it shared, right? <clears throat> yeah, the stage is yours. Good luck. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, for today, we will be talking about auxiliary, uh, auxiliary routes in Angular. So, talk was uh, amazing so we are actually been very interested to update our apps towards angular v14 so uh, for today's talk i will be talking on auxiliary routes in angular so what is the auxiliary route so before going into that so my name is mohammad abes i am a full stack software engineer i'm working on many uh, open source technologies like uh, the angular is my first lab on the front end side i'm working on angular so apart from that, let's start with the tech talk. So yeah. Well, what is the, the main concept of a auxiliary routes? So auxiliary routes are actually being the uh, navigation part 
in your Angular application. So if you want to uh, navigate towards multiple pages uh, without having the defined, uh, they, they are having the defined route, but they will, uh, those components are working on the outlet named outlet names. So if you want to, uh, in, uh, if you want to navigate, you navigate from pages to pages inside your Angular application. So that's kind of the auxiliary routes come over. So you can also optimize your application bundle size if you are using this auxiliary route strategy. So I will be talking on, uh, I will be talking in the deep in the upcoming slides. So yeah. So <clears throat> before starting the talk, so uh, the main purpose of auxiliary routes and why actually we need them. So uh, <clears throat> auxiliary routes actually allow you to insert or Toggle uh, or toggle your multiple portions of a single page application, such, such as like inside a page you are having the sidebar, or you are opening uh, you are opening a pop up or or a modal uh, on the basis of your uh, URL address bar URL. So uh, for those purposes, you need uh, the auxiliary route. So. And the main purpose behind it is like uh, you uh, like how you are going to achieve that. So you have to define the auxiliary route. So you First, you need to add a named router outlet, and uh, we actually the co the main content lies of the that component. So that's that's component on the basis of that route. That component will be attached to your DOM. So this is how the uh, auxiliary route will going to work with the named outlet. So if we are if we are achieving the if we are uh, implementing this auxiliary route, so we will be going to achieve uh, <clears throat> achieve the uh, optional strategy like having with the optimized thing while developing your application. So each component have a primary route, like assume that I have a shopping cart, I, I, I have a products page. So I, I have a user's page, I have an accounts page. So every component, uh, every component has defined a route inside their modules. So, but like inside that component, inside that routed component, there are multiple uh, functionalities, like assume that inside the product listing, I'm having the filter at uh, filter light at the side and then after I have a product cards and I have a storage, a, a, a storage strategy, a storage bar in which we are having with the storage filters and kind of other uh, stuff to perform operations on that product page. So those a bunch of uh, other strategies, those those sections should be lied in your routes are not uh, that much achievable for every use case. So there are uh, there are other use cases on which we have to achieve those certain things with auxiliary routes. Okay, so here are the multiple real uh, scenarios for implementing your auxiliary route. So uh, while linking your applications, your deep your deep parts of the application with a simple URL or kind of stuff. So like assume that you want to perform tab switching and with the tab switching, you want to persist your data. Uh, you want to persist that tab step with your URL. So on that strategy, you can, uh, you can achieve that thing with auxiliary route. And other thing, uh, and other use case is for opening a pop-up or opening a modal. So, like, assume that I have an authentication module. So, inside authentication module, I have uh, I have a sign-in, uh, I have a sign-in component, and I have a sign-up. So, for both of them, uh, if I want to open a sign-in, so I want to achieve, I want to have a address, I want to have a URL. I have want to have a route in my address bar for opening that login modal directly. So without without having the click operation. Okay, so uh, so those is stuff uh, like achieving Excuse with me. the uh, modal opening. So for Excuse uh, for, me, Mohammed. Yeah. Um, it seems you have a network issues. Can you try to turn off your camera uh, and continue? Okay, okay. Great, thank you. Is it fine now? Yeah, it's better. Okay, so uh, then after we will be coming with the uh, modal, uh, mo uh, after the modal or pop-up opening, so we are having also, we are having the other uh, other bunch of things like the fragment. Fragment is of kind of a multiple views. So 
if you are working on an angular application and you are having with uh, uh, a multiple views kind of stuff and those views should be those views should be achievable through a url or kind of a other deep link backstage so for those is for those stuff actually you also can achieve those things with auxiliary route so and another thing is like uh, achieving the multiple forms opening inside the tabs or if you want to uh, open a multiple forms or uh, multiple forms are on the basis of those uh, like uh, like kind of a tape switching strategy with those kind of stepper form you can say so uh, as, assume that there is a page and we are having the five steps inside uh, inside that component so we can achieve that with auxiliary route as well Okay, so uh, with this, uh, like uh, the main thing come like how we can implement this, uh, how we can implement this auxiliary route thing. So inside this, okay, let me go, sorry guys, okay. So uh, while implementing this, uh, how we are going to implement that is kind of uh, first of all you have to do the first of all you have to do and go the uh, sidebar uh, to add a route. Like assume that I have a sidebar component I have created in a shared directory. So with that shared component, you have to go in your route file and inside that routing file. So you have to do with uh, you have to add a route with the outlet property as well. So the path and components so offer both of them you should have to add an outlet thing so that outlet should be a named outlet so uh in the next snippet if you can see uh there is an anchor tag with a router link so if, if you are clicking on that uh on that anchor link so they will be going to uh they will be going to trigger that named outlet so the the uh the, uh, the rest of the thing is like uh as you created the outlet with uh outlet property with a sidebar value so you can now call your router outlet with uh, like kind of a named router outlet. So if you can see uh, there is a name sidebar in your router outlet. So when uh, like in the in 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 a browser view. So if you can see there is kind of a dashboard works component. So <clears throat> inside uh, show sidebar, if you are going to click that sidebar, so the URL should be uh, happened and the, the that URL should be appended with your address bar URL. The current URL and that uh, and that named router outlet will be showing to like that will be going to appear here. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, let's take an uh, let's take uh, let me show you guys uh, let me show you guys the main uh, working example. So how we are going to do that? So okay. Let me open that code. Okay, so uh, this is kind of uh, I, I was talking about uh, auxiliary route. So here we can uh, here we can achieve that. So now I have created a sidebar component. So inside that sidebar component, which I have been which which, which I have created. So with that sidebar component. Uh, I have imported that in, 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 in a certain module. So in my use case, uh, the app module. So I have imported it here. And other than that, uh, in your module routing file, so you have to add those uh, or add, add, an, add an object uh, object entry for that route. So my path is sidebar, I can say, and my component is a sidebar component, which I have been imported here on line number four. So I have added a outlet. On line number 18, you can see there is an outlet with a sidebar value, right? So I have to do that. So after doing this uh, outlet, uh, what I will be going to do is I have to add a named router outlet with a name of a sidebar. So with this 
with this only uh, only the only the address bar which will having with the sidebar uh, sidebar route so that will be loading this uh, that will be loading this uh, outlet section or a fragment so this is how uh, auxiliary routes are working so uh, if you can see uh, if, you, if you will be going to add this router outlet and if you are going to see in your in your consoles so in your in in your call so in your in your network call so that's actually kind of a very uh deeping strategy so that's kind of a very uh, optimization strategy so that that router will only be loaded once the url will having with the key of uh, that sidebar in the address in the address bar url so those uh, those are actually the optimize one of the optimization strategy as well but it also solves uh a multiple uh, kind of a use cases as i as i said like if you are having the fifth stepper forms so each step have each step as a form so like assume that if you are taking an example of uh, <coughs> on in, in in kind of a survey forms so those are the step forms step one step two step three so every step is consists of a form so for those strategies we can also work with the auxiliary routes as well so this is how auxiliary routes are working with so uh, I have showed you uh, that thing as well. So uh, this is it for uh, this session. So yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much, Muhammad, for a nice presentation. I think we really enjoyed and uh, yeah, auxiliary routes are not frequently used, but they are a very powerful feature for sure. Hey, Marco, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, sorry, there was uh, there was kind of a network issue maybe. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Uh, so there are no questions and uh, we can end up for today. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Muhammad, for joining. Yeah. And thanks everyone Thank for you. attending. See you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.